This set is based, as you can see, on a poster by Joost Schmidt for the Bauhaus exhibition of 1923. And it's very much the image we associate with the mature Bauhaus, with these interlocking planes, rectangles, and circles. But in 1923, the Bauhaus was still very vulnerable to the attacks of critics who claimed that it was too preoccupied with bizarre, individualistic, artistic expression, not sufficiently concerned with actual production. 1923 was something of a watershed in the development of the Bauhaus, and you've had a chance to study this in your unit. Since then, of course, and particularly after the very effective propaganda of the Bauhaus books and the exhibitions and the writings of the participants, the opposite view has tended to establish itself, that the Bauhaus was the first institution to apply itself single-mindedly to the problems of designing for industry. So, was it the Bauhaus of the visionary Johannes Itten, or the Bauhaus of the painters Kandinsky, Clay, Schlemmer, and so on? And what about Walter Gropius's ideas? Now, I'm not going to give you my answer. Instead, we've got together some direct evidence for you to look at. I want you to make up your own mind what each piece has to tell us about this problem, but I warn you, there isn't an easy answer. We've managed to get here in the studio some examples of Bauhaus products from this period, and we can look at them to see what they tell us about the Weimar Bauhaus. And we were fortunate enough to be able to consult a designer living in England who was himself a student at the Bauhaus from 1921 to 3, George Adams. We asked him to consider two statements by Walter Gropius. The first, an extract from the end of the 1919 Bauhaus Manifesto, and the second from his article of 1923, The Theory and Organization of the Bauhaus. And also to tell us about the conflicting personalities and attitudes of the time. Together, let us desire, conceive, and create the new structure of the future, which will embrace architecture and sculpture and painting in one unity, and which will one day rise towards heaven from the hands of a million workers, like the crystal symbol of a new faith. The crystal symbol, the cathedral of the new faith, could be explained in two ways, either in a way which perhaps William Morris or Ruskin had in mind, uh, a return to medieval practice, or uh, the crystal uh, cathedral of the future, a glass palace. Perhaps the first two years were predominant uh, expressionistic, if one wants to put a label like that on activity at the Bauhaus. But um, we were really against all this mystic blah blah uh, which accompanied expressionism, the individualistic way of doing things and especially against the medieval connotations which we found in the Bauhaus Manifesto. Uh, what happened with Itten was that he was, I think, a transition figure between Expressionism and a more rational outlook, which uh, the Bauhaus later on decidedly took. Uh, Itten, uh, was the first to, uh, coming from Vienna, it's not a surprise, um, he fostered the subconscious and he was able to bring out uh, what was hidden and break down inhibitions. We really had to produce an accident and out of this accident then grew something. In short, he was uh, getting out of us what was subconscious in our mind. Uh, that was one part of Itten's um, preliminary course teaching. The other part was really quite a disciplined one, one where we were asked to explore uh, gradations of um, 
light and shade or um, explore um, color uh, combinations and see what color does. Van Doesburg really started his lectures outside the Bauhaus for uh, us in 1922. And the four course, of course, I attended was in 1921. He maintained that this is the most progressive of the art schools uh, in Europe, as far as he knew. Mm. But then he started uh, tearing it down much to our delight, because many of the students then were a bit fed up with all the uh, mysticism and romanticism. And uh, we had already discussed things to a certain point where we felt um, our work must be more factual, more rational. And what this book preached was the rational approach against any subjectivism. It's no uh, accident that the movement was called the style, and the style was something we rejected always from the very beginning. We didn't want to create a style, not consciously anyway, like the Art Nouveau people did. Uh, we wanted to uh, create um, something which uh, has no uh, formalistic connotations. On the right, a spherical biscuit box, and on the left, a teapot in brass, but chromium plated, both by Naum Slutsky, the 2nd 1924. Did you notice that George Adams talked mostly about painters and their theories? But what about the crafts of the Bauhaus? We've got some examples of Bauhaus craftwork here in the studio. What does this silverware tell us about early Bauhaus craft? This tea set, for instance, by Christian Dell, who was the craftsmaster of the metal workshop. I particularly like this uh, little milk jug with its solid wooden handle, and its delicate spout, its highly sophisticated, uh, mannered, perhaps, curves. And the other pieces as well, beautifully handcrafted surfaces and a very sumptuous material. It's very attractive and it's well made, but it's really very similar to the silverware of many other designers of this period. We've seen how artists and craftsmen in the Bauhaus worked together, and a good example is this uh, tapestry with a design by Paul Clay made in the textile department between 1919 and 1923. Gunther Sturzel designed this black and white wool weave in 1924 when she was still a student. Of course, once set up for this weave, an industrial loom could produce this material by the yard. And yet, it has a sumptuous surface material with the different uh, constituent parts, the black wool, the white wool, and the shiny white silk thread running through it. Gunther Sturzel began experimenting in 1924-6 with all sorts of new materials for her weaves. Here are some snatches of this period, which include all sorts of different materials, cellophane, a string, silk, cotton, to provide uh, very unlikely combinations of uh, materials. This is a good example, I think, really, of Itten's aim to get the students to experiment with new materials. In this uh, example, for instance, you can see the string cellophane, different kinds of thread. And the result's a most unusual weave. These craft workshops may have produced little that was of revolutionary formal significance before 1923, but they did provide students with the opportunity of experimenting freely without being constrained by industrial demands and schedules, as Gropius makes clear in this extract from his 1923 essay on the Bauhaus. Intellectual education runs parallel to manual training. The apprentice is acquainted with his future stock in trade, the elements of form and color, and the laws to which they are subject. Red, for instance, evokes in us other emotions than does blue or yellow. Round forms speak differently to us than do pointed or jagged forms. 
the elements which constitute the grammar of creation are its rules of rhythm, of proportion, of light values, and full or empty space. When uh, Kandinsky started his seminar, he really started it off um, what one can call as a grammar of design. He explored together with us the affinity of form and color. But uh, as students, this is quite interesting. We were not really um, satisfied with our own conclusions. And we asked Kandinsky, couldn't we try and find out from other people less concerned with design how they react? And we started a market research and asked people how they felt about the affinity of color and basic geometric shapes. And we found that the majority confirmed our own conclusions. Yes, the two cradles are quite a good example. Uh, the one which was built uh, after it had uh, uh, been presented with a son by his wife was uh, a rather mystical uh, conception of a baby in a cradle with all sorts of Kabbalistic or mystical symbols uh, hand carved into it. At that time, we were already very much against Itten, who had got very much involved in Master's Nan. Um, the other uh, cradle uh, designed by Kayla was taking a somewhat naive use of uh, results from the Kandinsky seminar, namely the circle, the square, the triangle. But if you look at the cradle by Kayla, you have the uneasy feeling down came cradle baby and all. The Bauhaus believes the machine to be our modern medium of design and seeks to come to terms with it. But it would be senseless to launch a gifted apprentice into industry without preparation in a craft and hope thereby to re-establish the artist's lost contact with the world of production. The teaching of a craft is meant to prepare for designing for mass production. In 1923, or even before that, there was no industrial production. But on the other hand, one could say that one was able to produce a prototype in the craft workshop um, with a view of mass production, because mass production then was not as complicated a process as it is today. What was done uh, previously in chair design was discarded as being not honest and for machine production one should not be ashamed to show where the joints are. Riedfeld really designed his chair very much from the point of view of architect, though he was of course a very good craftsman as well. Um, I would say and I sat in both chairs, the Riedfeld chair was rather hard and the briar chair was very comfortable. Uh, that was due to the elastic webbing. And that shows again the sort of interplay between the various workshops because uh, uh, briar could go into the weaving department and ask the girls to uh, do some webbing or try out some of the fabrics there to see how it works. Um, as a seat or an armrest or a backrest for his chair. And that's how this chair, which was shown for the first time in 1923 at the exhibition, was evolved. The art of architecture and its many branches should not be a luxury, 
but the lifelong preoccupation of a whole people. At the very outset, the new architectural spirit demands new conditions for all creative effort. The house in Horn was the experimental house um, built with the purpose of the aim to be so economic in price that uh, a skilled worker in Germany would be able to afford it with all the mod cons included, like central heating and bathroom. Uh, this was, of course, one of our ideals. We wanted to penetrate into the mass market because we thought once our things are economically priced for the man in the street and, let's say, in available to be bought in shops like Woolworth, then, of course, we will succeed in changing the environment and that, we felt, would be also changing uh, man towards a better be. So the Haus am Horn was the nearest the Bauhaus came to economical, functional design by 1923. This is a model we've had made from plans and elevations of the original Haus am Horn. It was designed to be just the first of a housing development on land used by the Bauhaus as kitchen gardens. From the outside, the house is almost as simple as it could be, with low rooms surrounding a higher central section with clerestory windows on three sides. Inside, we can see something of the rationale for this. In the central section was where the main reception and living areas were, and it was surrounded by the service rooms, the hall, and the various bedrooms, and so forth. And it was these rooms which were furnished by the students and the staff of the Bauhaus, with the kind of simple furniture that would be needed for a workman's house. So here's the kitchen, and this was the dining room, and this was the children's nursery here. This is a view of the kitchen with built-in cupboards and working surfaces. Here's a view down this side, showing the kitchen at the end, and then the dining room, and in the foreground, the nursery. The ceiling light was one of the ones produced in the metal workshops, a disc of opal glass suspended from the ceiling to diffuse the light. On the left was a composite toy cupboard designed by Alma Boucher, which embodied several of the educational principles on which the preliminary course had itself been based. All the boxes are separate and can be recombined by the children for their own games. Some of the furniture was still highly formalist. The dressing table is by Marcel Breuer. This axonometric drawing of the ladies' bedroom shows the use made of built-in cupboards for shelves and hanging space. This bed by Eric Diekmann was in the man's bedroom. It appears to date from 1922, and it still retains some of the de style influences which we saw earlier in Breuer's furniture of the same date. These fat uprights are either too low for this plane or too high for this plane here. The whole bed's conceived as a grouping of pure planes and solids, and the joining of these parts uh, is quite disguised. This part here uh, is jointed by a hidden uh, metal pin arrangement in here without any visible and comprehensible attempt to mortise these parts together. We could contrast this bed of 1922 with the work that Diekmann was doing in 1925 in the Weimar Art School after the Bauhaus had moved on to Dessau. Here we find much greater simplicity and much less formalism. The chairs provide the very simplest uh, compromises between the rectangularity of the frame and the necessary incline for, of the back, which you need for comfort. The Bauhaus, with its training in abstract shapes and concepts, aimed at purity rather than simplicity of form. 
And the next stage for Breyer, as you know, was to develop his tubular steel chairs and stools at Dessau in 1925. This is probably his most famous one, the Vasily chair of 1925, which is still being manufactured today. Notice how something of this de steel formalism remains in the planes, for instance, of these straps here, and in the arbitrary way in which the jointing is achieved. You can't see how it works. Here he's been able to use the sort of formal experimentation with brightly polished metals and continuous curving forms to create something which is much more than a bentwood chair executed in steel, but something close to a sculpture to sit in. So, the secret of the development of the early years of the Bauhaus lies not in any single-minded development towards functionalist rationality, but in a mixture, I think, of three factors. Let me illustrate them with one item. This chess set by Joseph Hartwig of 1925. It's a rethinking of the forms of the chess pieces on rational lines, each piece representing the move it can make according to the rules of the game. This, for instance, is the knight, and it moves in an L shape like that. And this piece is the bishop, because it moves diagonally. It's also an example of designing which bears in mind the wasting and shaping processes of industry. This set's been manufactured industrially on several occasions, and you can see how the pieces, uh, there's no problem there for machine production. And finally, it's a formalist creation in the Bauhaus visual idiom, composed of the basic underlying forms, the square, circle and the triangle, which the students had been taught to use in the preliminary course of the Bauhaus, and which was a natural consequence, in this case, of placing Oskar Schlemmer as form master and Joseph Hartwig as craft teacher together in one studio to teach the students. That Hartwig should have produced this chess set is one symbol of the legacy left by the Weimar Bauhaus to Dessau.